podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, No Easy Feat, The Challenge of Securing the SMB, brought to you by Tech Evangelism and IS Decisions. Just a reminder that we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, so get those questions in and we'll answer as many as we can live at the end of the event. Now let's get down to business. Today's presenters are Nick Cavalancia, industry expert, speaker, author, and founder of Tech Evangelism. Joining Nick for today's conversation is Kate Fleming, technical sales manager for IS Decisions, a provider of infrastructure and security management software solutions for Microsoft Windows and Active Directory. Kate leads the team and the charge in securing data for over 3,000 customers relying on IS decisions to prevent breaches and ensure compliance. Welcome, Nick and Kate. And now I'll turn it over to Nick to get this conversation started. Thank you very much, Em. Hey, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining me today on today's webcast. Uh, you know, I think we're living at the, in a time where um, the concept of a cyber attack, if you think about this, it's no longer like an act of espionage or war or retaliation or anything like that. It's really more a matter of business, revenue, and profit, if you really think about this. Um, we, and like any other business, um, these cyber criminal organizations are looking for customers. I'm doing air quotes here in my office. Customers, that would be you and me. Um, and where they wish to you know, part with their data and or their money. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for customers just like any other business would be that would help them make a profit. And um, as we're going to kind of discuss in today's webcast, the SMB unfortunately is making itself a relatively easy target. Um, the, the planning and architecting, implementing and maintaining of a, a strong security stance um, is probably a challenge at best for most SMBs. Obviously, as you get smaller and smaller, it's more of a challenge for those of you that are on the, the medium side of the SMB. It's a little bit easier, um, but it's, it's certainly a challenge, especially even for the those running in the IT departments, as well even those that are MSPs that might be joining us today who have SMB customers. And so the question becomes, what's the best approach for SMBs to get secure? And that's what we're really gonna talk about today. Kate and I are gonna discuss why the SMB is a target, and what you can do about it. Now, um, as in all of my webcasts, love having um, interaction with the audience as much as we can. Use the Q&A box, not just for the questions that Emily mentioned early on, but also if you've got comments, you've got questions, jokes, funny anecdotes, anything you want to share, you want to stick in there as long as it's relevant, I'll be watching that throughout the webcast today. I want to try and encourage you uh, to participate as much as is possible. We will do questions officially at the end, of course, but if there's something kind of interesting or very, very, uh, uh, Dharmavir says hi. See, hi, I'm actually reading these. I wasn't lying. Um, and we also got a, a hey from someone in Atlanta, but the, uh, the question already got deleted, I think, off the, uh, off the board here. But anyway, so welcome from everybody. Uh, and so as always, make sure that you guys put some stuff in that, um, in that box. That way we can include you in on the conversation. So with that, let's kind of jump in here uh, and get things started. Um, the, the first thing that I just want to kind of introduce this topic, and then I'm going to um, bring Caden in on the conversation here, is talking about why I see the SMB being um, a very, very um, easy target for attackers. Um, there's a couple of stats I'm going to use from some very good um, reports. And uh, I want to use these not just because I want to throw fun at you. That's obviously not going to really help. I think it's more just to kind of set the tone for what's going on in the industry. So that way, um, I want you guys to walk away from this webcast getting rid of some of that, ah, it'll never happen to us kind of thinking. And more so thinking, mm, you know, maybe it could and we should be prepared. That's my goal out of today's webcast. So the, the first one actually comes from a report from IBM. Um, you can see here 62% of all cyber attacks, it's the SMB. And so that, that's a really high percentage. I've seen some lower numbers that are probably in the 30% range, but even if it's a third, even if it's almost almost two thirds here in this number, whatever it is, it's a material percentage. It's not saying, well, you know, only 8% of the SMB, everyone's going after the big guys. Not the case here. Um, the, the, I've got four other stats here that all come from a, a recent Ponymon study around uh, what CISOs are caring about in 2018. 40% um, of CISOs in the SMB, they rate their security, if you see this, as highly effective. Now, the reason why I bring this up is it's only 14%. Um, that's really bad. So uh, any kind of head of security for an SMB is really going, I, I don't think that we're highly effective at all. And that might include you or one of your customers if you're an MSP. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, reviewing the security posture of the organization, you see here only 16% of them uh, are only doing it after an attack happens. Um, now, some of them are doing it, of course, maybe irregularly and this kind of thing, but it was really kind of bad to see, even though this is a small percentage here, I thought it was really bad to see that 
there are people that literally are thinking, you know, we're just going to check our security after something bad happens. And we'll go, well, gee, I wonder why that happened. We should figure that out. That's obviously not a good place to be. We want you to be thinking about having proactive measures in place. You know, maybe not to the same degree as an, your enterprise counterparts, but something in place that is definitely proactive in nature to make sure that you are as um, little of it being an easy prey as is possible. 61% um, of uh, the SMB uh, hit by cyber attack. This just corroborates the number from the IBM study. So they're very, very close in nature here. So kind of look at it that way. And then 54% hit by data breaches. So these are all really big numbers around the SMB. It kind of denotes that if you look at even the second bullet as the we're not really highly effective. And then you look at the, the first, the fourth, and the fifth bullet here, and you see that uh, SMB's getting hit by attacks. There, there's a real uh, corroboration between those two numbers. Those really do relate, and that's part of the problem here. So um, we're gonna we're gonna talk, uh, Kate and I here, about why the SMB is a target, and talk about this issue. Talk about the state of security and what you probably have in play, what you should have in play, and then was it really going to take to get you secure, and where should you be placing your focus? Um, and as always, again, stick some stuff in the Q and A box. We got questions throughout. So. Um, I, I found this uh, this graph. Uh, I'm trying to think what report I got this from. It might have been that same CISO report, if I remember correctly. Um, but it was basically, this just kind of made the point. And it's not so much these exact reasons at the bottom, like lack of resource, lack of expertise, lack of information, lack of time, lack of training, although they are all very relevant and very real. These are the percentages of, of SMB organizations that, um, that rate what their challenges are around um, around security. But it's it's this key word that, that follows all the way through, a key phrase, it's lack of. And uh, and that's one of the reasons why you're the SMB, like no other, ha doesn't have a lot of staffing, doesn't have a lot of budget, doesn't certainly doesn't have a lot of expertise because you don't have a lot of staffing. Um, you know, those kind of things, all those things kind of come into play, and it's this issue of the lack of. And um, Kate, let me play into the conversation here. Maybe we can jump into some of these issues and maybe some ones that even aren't on the, the, uh, on the board here. Um, I, I see this as sort of a, a very basic high-level list that I put up, just to kind of make the point more than anything. Um, would you maybe go over, do you have a couple more uh, you know, specific reasons why you guys are seeing the SMB as being a target? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of our SMB clients, they come to us for this kind of stuff too, and they really you know, bring, the issue of, okay, I know I need something that sounds great, but you know, who's going to do it? Who's going to be in charge of this project? Who's going to implement, you know, I'm with these smaller organizations. We don't have our, you know, security officer who's, you know, got his team going. I'm all by myself. I'm the IT admin. I'm already managing, you know, uh, the active directory and my windows infrastructure. Adding security on top is, you know, it's a full-time job that's even, you know, separated into several different um, roles in, in a big enterprise that has that kind of resource. So, so yeah, it's getting everybody behind it and getting it organized and something where it can be effective and, um, and cost, you know, um, affordable for a small SMB that doesn't have all these resources. All these resources, really, they come back to, to money, you know, lack of expertise, information, time, all of that can, can be bought. You know, it can be bought by outsourcing or uh, bringing on more people. But, you know, when you're already, um, you're already small and you need to, to do with what you've got, there are solutions out there, but there is, uh, yeah, there is this vulnerability as this smaller company um, that we don't have this fortress around us like a, a big enterprise can can afford to do. Yes, I, I think the answer is just print print your own money. If you guys could just print your own money, uh, yeah. all your problems <laughs> will go away. Um, so let me ask you guys in the audience, um, just stick this in the Q&A box. Anybody that wants to participate, just this isn't a formal poll or anything, but I'm just wondering um, for whether it's for you or if you're an MSP for your customer, what is the biggest challenge around implementing security? And and while you guys do that, um, David Deere says 42. That's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. That is not the answer to my question. You have to answer my <laughs> question, David. Um, yes, big Douglas uh, Adams fan here. Anyway, so um, I think, uh, Kate, that's a really good point about the issue of like who's going to implement it. I was just seeing a, a security product the other day. Um, something that is sort of out of band. It doesn't fit into any specific genre. And this guy actually wanted me to to take a look at it, and it was very, very complex in some ways. And, um, and, and just thinking about who's gonna implement that, like for an SMB, 
the way it's architected could even make a difference. You know, it's sort of like the adoption of something right. in an SMB where they go, we don't have time to master all this. We need something that is down and dirty and easy to do. Uh, David says the C-suite buy-in is a challenge for him. Uh, Steve says uh, the top management doesn't understand cybersecurity. That's interesting. So those right. are both sort of buy-in buy -in issues. Um, anybody else stick some in there I see here? Uh, MPOP says legacy systems and technology. Okay, that's a good one. Um, just from the standpoint of you've already made the investment and now you're asking for another investment in something else that may require you know, updating your infrastructure, updating your storage, updating your operating system, you know, something like that. Um, Randy has an interesting one. He says lack of priority. Um, right. And that's that's another interesting one. There was just, it, it falls to the bottom of there. Um, so let me ask you this, uh, Kate, maybe we can zero in on some of the, the top reasons, if you will. You know, and you've kind of you know touched on it a little bit, but I just want to see if you know I, I'm going with an overall lack of focus on security, which kind of aligns with what Randy said, lack of priority. I think as, as you get smaller and smaller, the focus is on just being um, uh, operational, so that you can bring in revenue, so that you can keep the business going and pay people, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a focus on how do we keep it all you know secure. I mean, what, what's your top reason? Um, yeah, definitely the focus on the security and then, um, yeah, I think the, the top reason is really, it's, it's priority and implementation, you know, the, we can't get anybody behind it and, you know, an IT admin is the one who's going to have, it's all going to become falling down on him, uh, or her and we need the resources of the C-suite to back us up. But the problem is, uh, yeah, often we have like the lone wolf out there who's putting out all the fires and we really need um, the resources and the help to get it, to get it going. Um, so yeah, I think the, the, the problem is just the, um, the lack of focus on the, the priority to get, that, to get that in place. And it's always, yeah, we can be reactive, but if we were proactive, you know, we could have avoided some of these issues. Yeah, I, I find that um, even though I spend a lot of my time when I talk about security, I, I feel like I'm sort of warning people on the, the Paul Revere, you know, the British are coming, the British are coming and yeah. saying the attackers are coming, the attackers are coming. Um, it, it in some ways, even to you guys in the audience, and I'm going to say this is even fair on your part to you might go, ah, Nick, you're full of FUD, man. That's just fear, uncertainty and doubt. And, but the reason why I, I feel so strongly about it, why I don't feel like it's fear, uncertainty, and doubt is because statistically speaking, it's happening over and over and over again. It's a reality of today as opposed to saying, ah, we really got to wash out for those really obscure one-off things over here that no one's ever seen and is only seen one time in some remote place. No, no, no. We're talking about stuff that's happening to every business of every size worldwide. There's tons and tons of of analyst reporting that demonstrate that this is, is real. Um, so let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the state of SMB security. And as we're doing this for you guys in the audience, um, there's a, a question. This is really going to be around what you have in place. That's what this is. This slides me about. So as I'm going through this and we're talking about this a little bit, um, I would love to know a what you have in place. You know, even if you're just rattling off a couple of acronyms or whatever, or you, the way you want to, any way you want to generalize it, that's fine. And uh, that's the first one. And then the second one is kind of uh, any commentary you have on the, the challenges of getting this implemented, utilizing these things, anything like that. Just I want to, again, I want to include you guys in on the conversation as much as we can here. So um, I think you may have actually even mentioned this a little bit. Um, Kate, and, and, and not so many words, but you had mentioned this a little bit before, and I see that most SMBs are focused on what I'm calling protected security. And what I mean by that is they're putting things in place that are certainly proactive, and that's good, and you should do that. There's nothing wrong with doing this, but it's just let me put the, the barriers up. And, and that's enough. If I put the barriers up, I'm, I'm good. And so some of those things are things like, um, you of course have antivirus or anti-malware on an endpoint. Um, uh, you, might, you might have, you know, of course you have patch management, everyone should have patch management in place at this point. If you don't, you really should. You're, you're asking for a real problem just because of the known vulnerabilities in operating systems, in your web browsers, in Flash, in Java, and so on. Those are all the, the pathways into an organization. Uh, maybe something like an email or web filter, maybe both. You know, platforms that are scanning for um, either um, malware or they're looking for any kind of uh, malicious links that might exist. 
that kind of stuff, uh, code that shouldn't be uh, utilized inside of, let's say, a Word doc and a macro or something like that. All that kind of stuff comes in play. And then even things like uh, two-factor authentication, intrusion detection, you know, other things that are, that are protecting your organization. And this would be the equivalent I think for an SMB would be the equivalent of, uh, let's say, I always go back to the old sort of um, methodology of like castles and the time of, you know, the knights and people with swords and arrows and, and bows and whatnot. And you look at how um, how all this was built. It's always done where I want I, have a, I need to protect my little village. So what am I going to do? Let's build some walls around it. Well, if someone gets to the walls, that's a problem. So let's build maybe a moat around that. And they'll put a bridge and, you know, I mean, those common things where you're putting layered security, but you don't just dig the moat and you don't just build the walls and you don't just close the gate and you're done. You have to do more than that. There's a bit more that I think is necessary and some SMBs don't focus on beyond protective measures is detection. Those type of measures where you're actually watching constantly to see, is, do I have a breach? Are people coming in? You know, what's going on with the current state of the environment? Because here's the reality. If you put those, um, those preventative type security measures in place, it's a, it's a point in time snapshot of your security. Meaning our security with the day I put it in, is is going to do this much securing but that doesn't necessarily mean that as attackers um, improve their game as they look for new ways to try and take advantage um, of uh, um, of the defenses that are in play um, you're not detecting any of that i give you a really good example i, I was at a, um, a, a conference last week where i spoke about assigning risk levels to um, users within the organization um, and Kevin Mitnick was one of the keynote speakers, and he demonstrated a very simple, um, a very simple type of attack, where it macroless, codeless. It was just a simple link that was inside of a PDF. That once a PDF gets opened, um, it automatically would try and do an SMB connection to an external server, basically like to an IP address. So basically trying to connect to like whack whack IP address whack share name, and by doing so. It's trying to pass the credentials, ends up passing the username and the hash. Well, now that I've done that, you now have a valid username and a hash. You can do a pass the hash attack once you can get access internally inside of an organization. And there's no detection for that. It was very hard to detect anyways. But my point is just putting protective measures in place. You would never think that a simple U uh, U uh, um, SMB, as I say, I guess a UNC path, so I'm trying to think of, a simple UNC path mentioned inside of a PDF file in a very specific way, you'd never really think of that as a threat, and so your protective measures aren't going to protect against it, and yet, you know, you'd have detective ways of figuring out that's happening. Um, this, of course, if you have no detection, then you aren't going to have any response. Uh, I'm going to guess that at least some of the smaller SMBs, if not all of you, potentially don't have an incident response plan in place. What are you going to do when those things happen? happen. Um, and the reality is this is more of a, a perspective thing. Um, there's no perspective around thinking, what if the protection fails? Um, you definitely need to have a layered security strategy, one where you're making the assumption that the previous layer is going to fail. It's the very reason why, back to the castles and everything, you didn't just dig a moat around your, um, uh, around your village because you said, well, let's just assume that people are going to get in boats and come across. Okay, so we need something else. Let's assume that that fails and some people can get across. So then what do we do? Let's build walls. Okay, well, then what if they actually bring across ladders? Let's assume that that's going to fail. Great. Let's get um, tar vats, uh, or, you know, vats of tar. Let's get some arrows and, and archers ready. And then what if that fails? And then they start having these layered security strategy kind of discussions all around the assumption that some layer of protection is going to fail. And that's a good thing. It's not that we're saying the protection failing is good, but that you're thinking about if it should, I need to have another layer of security in place. So, um, Kate, let's do this. Let's start with the tech that's in place. Um, I mentioned some types of technology that's there, that the protective type stuff that might be in place. Um, what other kind of techs are, are you seeing with customers that maybe I didn't mention? Um, a lot of customers, you know, because they have Windows Active Directory, are tell us that they've started with Windows auditing um, as their layer of, you know, uh, what they're doing for for security. Um, but auditing is is just one, you know, tiny step, really. Um, for for the state, it, you're not doing any response. You know, that's you can just read through lists and lists of what's happened, but anybody who's had any experience with Windows auditing, it's extremely 
cumbersome. It's uh, difficult to scroll through. And really, you know, by the time you found that, what's already happened? You know, it's like it can take up to months, even a year for a breach to be found. What good is it to have this, this auditing trail if there's no, you know, detection and response for, you know, when your protections in place actually fail? Yeah, that's nice about the uh, the auditing, and I love that. That's that I've seen that as well. Uh, is that it ends up the auditing itself is a method of detection. Um, the challenge, as you mentioned, is the the slew of data. Um, so the, the the real challenge I think with auditing is um, that it's just purely information, meaning it's not presented to you in a way that provides you any kind of in, uh, um, intelligence or insight. Those are the two things you want for you guys in the audience beyond just information. I want information, yes, but not so much that I have a needle in the haystack. I would like it also to be presented in an intelligent way. So that's something where maybe you go after a SIM solution or an event log consolidation solution or something else that's going to try to make it where, for example, if I do a, um, a copy or a move of a file, um, in a in a Windows uh, file system, it shows us like I think it's like six different entries that make up all the different actions that take up to do a a, um, a move of a, a piece of data, and so that's just information. You'd rather just uh, a piece of uh, in, uh, intelligence that says Nick moved a file from there to there. And that's what you'd like to see a single entry. But really, what you want is then to go to something where it's more insightful, where it's telling you what you should do about it, um, and that's something that's well beyond it. But for those of you that are doing uh, auditing or haven't begun yet doing auditing rather um, the basic stuff out of the box for windows um, you can definitely do some stuff with event viewer there are ways to use some of the uh, the filtering that's in there as well as do some actions where you can at least use as sort of a detection type of solution so um, uh, Kate let me ask you this I'm thinking about some of the dangers um, that happen if if um, organizations are really just focused on the protective stuff maybe the auditing is the only method of detection if you will in place if they're purely focused on putting those kinds of solutions in place uh, but maybe nothing further what are some of the dangers you guys are seeing with prospective customers um, well clearly the biggest problem is the time from the attack to the detection is just way too long I mean what can you do it can take 20 minutes for your entire network to be compromised. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people who come to us and say, is there any retroactive way to see what happened and how this all went down? And it's like, well, no, you know, it, <laughs> it happened. You need something in place to prevent it from happening. Um, and, you know, even then sometimes it's difficult for people to understand you can't have this happen again. What you have in place, it's not enough, you know, even just, Pointing the finger and the blame, you know, maybe that's what you just need in the in the short term because someone needs to be able to explain. But wouldn't you rather just be at ease and know that you know what that happened? Uh, I've learned from it. Now I've got something in place where next time it's not going to happen that same way. Yeah, on the on the topic of um, you know time to um, to to uh, um, I guess detect that. Uh, you have an intruder, you have an attack being done, and so on. There's a couple of stats that I can think of. Um, one is the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, which comes out every year. If you guys in the audience aren't reading that, you're, you're missing out. It's every March to April-ish it comes out. Great report, lots of real relevant data about what's going on in the industry. And they, while they didn't this year provide specific numbers, there's a graph around the time to detect that there's been a breach. So not just that you've been attacked, but there's actually been a breach. And they just showed it in terms of days, weeks, months, and years. And what you see is the time to detect is largely over, the, it's sort of like it looks like a bell curve right over months. So the, the by and large, that's the best that they give you. They don't actually give you specific like 78% of people. You know, no, it doesn't like that. It's just a bell curve that ends up kind of uh, coming uh, over months of time. So they're basically implying in that, um, or I mean, I should say I'm inferring from that graphic that it takes months of time on the average to detect there's been a breach. Um, Microsoft has some threat analytics that they've posted. Um, and it's a, a threat analytics solution that they have. And one of the stats that they put out there is that the um, the median time, so not the average, but the median. And if, for those of you that don't remember, uh, you know, high school accounting or whatever, or statistics rather, um, the mean is the average. Median is the exact middle number in the all of the, the data set. And then the mode, of course, doesn't really matter, but that's one that happens most frequently. But the median number of days that an attacker lives on your network before they're detected is 146 days. That is the median number. That's a huge, huge, that's five months almost. 
So uh, detection is a, a really big deal here. Um, and so the state of security here is, yeah, you've got the basics in place. Even if you got some of the, the more advanced stuff, like the, the, the two-factor authentication, intrusion detection, uh, data loss prevention, I mean, those kind of things, all that stuff, that's great, and I'm glad you have that, and you should. Um, but for those of you that are on this call, I'm guessing most of you don't have a ton uh, in place that is really advanced because of all the issues that we talked about on the, the first slide. So let's do this. Uh, Kate, let's talk about getting the SMB secure and kind of give these guys uh, a light at the end of the tunnel. And my goal here for you guys in the audience is not to, um, not to say go buy these kinds of solutions because that isn't the answer. Everyone's organization is a little different. My goal on, on the, um, the call today is to try to elevate your thinking around what it is that you're, you're looking for, how you're gonna approach the problem, and then you kind of apply it in your own way because each of you has different budgets, different time constraints, different uh, technical needs, um, different compliance standards to adhere to, and the list goes on and on and on. So I can't possibly say, if you just paint the server room blue, everything will be fine because it's not the same color for everybody is the idea. Um, so as I mentioned on the last slide here, I was talking about that you have to have a layered security strategy. So you're looking for ways to augment the security that you have um, and this can be augmented um, let's say for example just on the endpoints you could have antivirus and have endpoint protection and have endpoint detection and response and uh, and uh, application whitelisting you know all on the on the endpoint if that's what you want but I, I like to think of it more strategically where it's far more layered across the board looking at how or attackers are coming in and what types of security measures should you be putting in place. Um, and then the reality is, as you're doing this, um, you wanna make sure that they're gonna be what I call here SMB friendly. And uh, it's great that someone can have a solution that will work for an SMB. It doesn't mean that it's actually going to function well. Um, we, we, we've already, and you guys, I think, already feel the pain of the issue of that lack of on that first slide. There's a lack of, and you can, you know, put your own uh, word there at the end. And so there's a couple of criteria that I'm thinking about specifically that you want to be looking at to make sure that they are SMB friendly. And I've got six things here and I want to kind of talk about those and maybe the, the kinds of solutions. Um, the, the first one is what I'm calling easy adoption. And adoption is really critical, especially if it's a solution where users have to be involved. Um, we want to make sure that it's um, something that um, that the users don't mind using as opposed to if the users go, this is too difficult, it's never going to fly. You think that getting buying, buying in from your C-level is difficult? Um, get your users to hate it and have it just become shelfware. That's even worse. You look terrible then. If you had a great solution, nobody would use it. Um, and so that means as you're thinking about solutions, you might want to be putting, in some cases, solutions like in at your gateways, at your entry points into the network. So maybe it's like the firewall. It is that email or, or web uh, filtering type gateway that exists. Things like that, those are very easy to adopt because you will never see it. Or if you are putting something on the endpoint or something that's going to utilize a user um, or interact with a user, make sure that it's easy for them to adopt. Um, should obviously be cost effective. You don't have a lot of dollars. You know that already. Um, but you're trying to find something. When I say cost effective, I just don't mean that, oh, it puts security in place and it's only $3 a seat or, you know, or whatever the cost is. I actually mean you're thinking about what kind of security is it really putting in place for you? Uh, how, how much is it actually creating a layered security strategy for you? Um, how much is it going to help you protect, detect, respond you know, you know, to, the, uh, to security breaches or security issues that come into play? All of that for that, whatever it is, $3 a seat or you know, whatever number it is, the cost is. Um, uh, it should be accurate, which is an interesting one for you guys. Um, I don't think you can, you can take a lot of false positives. Um, you don't have a lot of time in the first place, so you're not going to have time tra chasing down, you know, 50 alerts today uh, on potential issues. You want things that are very accurate in their execution. Um, you know, like, for example, a really good example, something you already have, antivirus. Um, especially, let's just take the old signature-based antivirus detection, right? Even though signature-based is all but dead today. But even so, if it matches this exact pattern, it's malware. It's a virus. That's as accurate as you want it. Just, you know it's bad, target it, quarantine it, notify me, let's be done. That's it, right? That's what you want, you want accuracy. Um, I mentioned the information and the intelligence and the insight. Intelligence is greater than information is this bullet here. You wanna make sure that whatever you're using is something that is at least providing you intelligence. 
So um, if this were, for example, a webcast, just using the example, Kate, that you gave about the auditing, um, if this were an auditing webinar and IS Decisions was selling you an auditing solution, which they have no interest in doing because they don't sell that, um, I would say mm, Windows, you know, Windows auditing is good for information, but the intelligence you're really lacking, you need to get a third-party solution in order to do that. So if you're really focused on auditing, I would tell you, yeah, find something else because I don't think even the native auditing is really SMB friendly for the key reason that it's just pure information. Uh, should be automated. You, you want this should be somewhat set it and forget it to a degree. Uh, something where it's it's going to do the detection, uh, sorry, do the protection. It's going to do the detection, and it's going to do some of the response for you automatically, and let you know that it happened. That's far better. You should be doing something that's more policy driven, and then the policies get executed by the solution more than anything. And then the last one here is what we all want. We all want it to be effective. Um, it needs to be something that's actually going to help with the security, not just kind of gives you warm fuzzies because everyone says you need a you know product X or product type X instead of be something that's really protecting your organization. So those are the ones that I'm thinking of and I've talked enough on this slide, Kate. Um, so let's let's maybe talk about this criteria list that I've got up here. Um, uh, what did I miss? I missed something I'm sure. So what did I miss out of the list of what, what should be SMB friendly for a solution? Um, yeah, well, one that kind of goes with easy adoption I was thinking of is being non-disruptive. So for the user, sure. like you mentioned, as soon as the user is like, oh, I have to jump through like hoop X, Y, and Z to get on, onto my machine and to do this and that, I'm not productive. As soon as, you know, the management hears that, it's it's gone, it's out. So it needs to be non-disruptive for the user and for the, the IT admin. If, you know, we're creating we're putting solutions in place where everybody has to, you know, spend a lot of their day managing it and, and getting around it. It's just, it's, it's not, you know, user friendly and it's going to get pushed to the wayside. Um, and, and yeah, we want something that has limited administration. If you need to have somebody, you know, you need to hire somebody to, you know, work on just this one solution. Uh, you know, we're not being cost effective anymore. You know, is that really, yes, maybe in the long, long term, that person's salary is going to outweigh the cost of a breach. But really, we need something that, you know, of course, is super effective, but it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, we don't need a watchdog on it. Otherwise, we just have a person, you know, watching, looking through auditing logs if that's what we're going to do. So, you know, it's easy and adaptable for everyone and just make it easy on IT. I mean, we're trying to make their life easier while securing, you know, the network and not having users like, you know, I had to sign in here, then I had to put a badge there, and then I needed to, you know, SMN, SMS code here, and, you know, we needed to be smooth and transparent. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense, and as I'm thinking about this, there's no slide for this, um, this next thing I just want to mention for you guys in the audience. Um, there's a, a number of sort of layers, and I shot, put a, probably should have made a slide for this for you as you're thinking about creating a layered security strategy. And the goal is for you to try and, and come up with security in, uh, that covers as many layers as possible, or at least does the job of doing so. And so you've got kind of what I call your gateway, and that's those entry points. Could be email coming in, could be somebody going out to a website that might be compromised. Um, could be someone trying to hack through a firewall, but it's the gateway in general. Um, you've got your endpoints. Your endpoints have to be secure, and that's not just antivirus. It could be endpoint protection, endpoint detection and response. It could be uh, application whitelisting and so on. You got that. You have the user. The user's another one because the, someone's credentials, they try to get compromised. I think it's uh, comprom uh, compromised credentials was the number one um, attack variety for data breaches, according to that Verizon Data Breach Investigations report. And so they have the user, that's three. Um, then you've got um, privileged accounts. You've got to protect those and the use of privileged accounts, make sure they use appropriately. Um, you have to worry about your infrastructure. As someone tries to laterally move within your organization, they're trying to move from system to system to system. So while infrastructure, maybe you're normally thinking about routers and switches and your firewalls and so on, um, I'm just thinking about infrastructure, meaning any kind of um, physical device, or in this case, maybe even a virtual device on your network that is leveraged as part of laterally moving within an organization. And the last thing is your data. So there's six kind of layers of the security that you need to be thinking about. And as you're trying to put all of these criteria, the six I've got up here and the, the two that Kate mentioned, um, you might want to think about how do I come up with you know, um, solutions that are going to cover as much of that as is possible, or at least put a stop to you know, people trying to get access to my data or something that cover a, a one, you know, more than one of those layers, if you will. Um, 
So Kate, this this generally when I talk about lots of layers like this, it sounds like lots of solutions and it starts thinking, you know, I, I think that sometimes the audience goes to like, well, it sounds very enterprise, but I'm a little guy. And mm -hmm. so the question I'm thinking for you uh, is, do you think that the SMB audience should be expecting um, an enterprise caliber type solution? I mean, in terms of the benefit that it brings and the value and so on, not so much that it's, you know, difficult to use and so on, but is enterprise caliber solution or should, do you think they should really be looking and expecting something more that's tailored for their needs? What's your thought on that? Um, well, I think the SMB has similar security needs to an enterprise. I mean, their data is just as sensitive uh, to them, you know, and to the well-being of their their organization, their existence, um, it can all quickly, you know, come crumbling down with a breach, especially for a smaller organization. So I think that the the need for something that's just as effective, you know, that an enter a large enterprise would expect, um, is still there. It needs to be addressed. Um, I think that you know you need something, and you need something that's scalable. You know, maybe we're a small, medium business today, but that doesn't mean that uh, we're going to grow and expand. And we need solutions that that can expand with us. Um, so I don't think it's that, you know, the security need is, I mean, totally different. We shouldn't say, oh, we don't expect, you know, to be able to secure everything. We don't have the resources for it. Uh, we need to just see the same vulnerabilities that SMB has as a large organization, uh, like, you know, different layers that you mentioned, the, the endpoints and the logins and things like that. And, yeah, we need something. We need something in place. We should expect the same kind of of caliber. Yeah, I always think of it as sort of being SMB sensitive in terms of its implementation and use, but it should be enterprise caliber in terms of its focus and effectiveness. So, um, and Tim says here, what were the two? Oh, non-disruptive, and the other one was uh, you said what? Limited administration. Is that what the other one you limited said? Limited administration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was the other one. That was the other two that weren't on there. So Pim asked. I thought that's uh, that's appropriate here. All right. So let's do this. I know you've got some slides. Um, and Kate, let me first just sort of summarize this up for our audience here. I know you got a couple slides you're going to cover, and then um, we've got some questions coming in here. So you guys, again, if you have more questions, stick those in the Q and A box. There's already some coming in now, and we'll take those at the end. So. Um, the idea here is if you're trying to simplify the security and try to overcome this idea of this challenge of SMB security, um, you know, the first thing that you have to think about is you have to identify where you lack, that lack of in your organization. And it might be something that has nothing to do with technology because a lot of you said things like a lack of, of buy-in from the C-suite or a lack of budget or whatever the case is, but you've got to kind of figure out what, what, you, what you have to work with and start moving forward thinking about this layered security approach um, but thinking about it from a standpoint of the, the kinds of, you know, obviously it's going to be solutions for the most part. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in that, that uh, needle in the haystack, lots of information, doing it yourself kind of thing. And in most cases, especially when it comes to attacks, you can't do it without a solution that's watching for you. Um, but you need something that like I put here, minimum effort, maximum impact, you know, something along those lines that really aligns with those, I guess it's, you know, it was an eight criteria or something that we came up with on the last slide, the six on the slide, the two you mentioned, Kate, um, that are going to really benefit your organization. So, um, so think about that a little bit. Um, Kate, uh, I'm going to hand the reins over to you and you'll go ahead and you can do your slides there. And then at the end, for you guys in the audience, again, if you've got questions about anything we've talked about in the slide presentation today or anything that Kate's going to cover now, stick those in the Q&A box. We'll be happy to answer those at the end. So with that, Kate, go ahead and take things, uh, take it over. All right. You should have control now if you want to, yeah. Cool, can we see your screen? Everybody can see my screen? All right, yeah, so, yeah, we're good. so here at IS Decisions, about 90% of our clients are small medium business. Um, and what we propose is a solution called User Lock, where we're creating this layered security approach where we're creating restrictions, uh, detecting users based on what they need to work. So we talked about um, you know, this layered approach. You've already got Active Directory and Windows in place. You've got a certain organization that you work with. You've got your users and your groups and your OUs. 
you've created rules for them already based on their access. Uh, we're just using that same infrastructure that you have in place and you're you know, well adapted to, to now add another layer of security for the user's logon. So uh, like we talked about before, all the different you know, ways that somebody can get into the network, really it all comes back to the logon, whether it's a careless employee who's left their you know, login and password laying around or who has left an unattended workstation, um, to you know, a malicious user coming in, to somebody who's got a dormant virus on their machine. There's a million different scenarios. I won't bore you with all of them because you're probably more familiar than me. But what we can see from the data and our experience is it comes from the logon. So what do we need to do to secure that logon, that entry into our system? So we have to reduce the risk of unauthorized access without making it too complex. Like we said, if it's not adopted, uh, easily adoptable by the users and by the IT admin, it's just, it's never gonna be put in place. So we need something that's non-disruptive. We talked about this in the last side with uh, non-disruptive and limited administration. So we can't frustrate the ID, IT department. The idea is to make their job easier. So we need something uh, that's transparent enough for the IT department, it's easy to manage. They can, they're having this detection in place exactly for the reason that they don't have to go and look and search and see all the time what is going on. We need to add that, that intelligence layer. Um, again, fast implementation and easy to manage. Um, I know there's some other solutions out there where you need you know, somebody to come on premise for three days, you need to buy hardware to get the thing installed, you need a whole server that's dedicated to this solution. And then you know, once you start adding up all these different criteria just to get the solution in place, it's already too many hurdles. Um, user lock is something that's really easy to install, to get up and running, to deploy. Uh, you can have it up and running within the hour and you can start seeing results. So you also need something that's transparent, that's not impeding the end users and productivity. Like we said before, you know, getting uh, the backing of the C-suite and um, the upper management. If you get something in place that starts creating more help desk tickets, more complaining by end users, it's just never going to get off the ground. So we've taken all of this into consideration with user lock um, to really make something that's it's effective, it's in place, it's able to create this uh, security later to prevent users from logging in from places, from times, from machines that they're not supposed to. So a, a normal user who's behaving like they should be sh might never even know that user lock exists. The thing is when you have the abnormal behavior or because of a malicious user or just a careless one or a breach, this is where we, user lock comes in and is able to, to help. So um, we've got a, I've got a couple of use cases here. These are like the most common risk scenarios that uh, clients come to us for. This is what's happening. I don't know what to do. Uh, I think user lock might help. So some of these might ring a bell. Don't hesitate to uh, ask questions for after if um, maybe you've thought of something else in your experience that uh, user lock might, might address. So. When we're talking about breaches, what we need to know is where are people accessing from? What's the origin? And how can we make sure that users log in from where they're supposed to? So um, you might think like, yeah, why would somebody from a human resources department go log into a sales team computer? They probably never will. But if their credential gets stolen and there's no security measure uh, preventing them from logging in anywhere, whether it's the machine down the hall, whether it's uh, an Outlook web access session that's coming from a country where, you know, we never work in, so uh, there should be no reason for for that origin, or the a Wi-Fi VPN access which is coming from a machine that we don't recognize. So we have this logon to an Active Directory where we can tell users again, users one by one. So we're not able to create policy by groups or OUs, um, which we can do in user lock, which is making it much easier for the IT admin to say, okay, I have this group, 
they have access to this, this, and that. Now I'm going to put in place a security policy that goes with their, you know, this group, what they need access to, how they work, um, to make sure it's all contextual, it all makes sense. Um, so with user lock, the origin is important. Where are people coming from when they get into my network? Uh, another layer we can add is time. So this is just another a context. So maybe um, it seems like I don't want to, you know, put time limits on users. But then again, if somebody logs in at 3 a.m. on a Saturday, that's a red flag. And that's something that should never happen. Um, if we can detect it, that's great. But maybe it's too late. We should probably, we need to put restrictions in place. Don't let that happen. I need to... I need to reduce my attack, basically, my um, attack area, right? Because that's what we have. We have all these different endpoints. We have users that log in from different, um, different machines because we're more flexible. We have working environments that are different. Some of you probably work with third-party uh, contractors or remote users. We need to still be able to put in place security measures I can say like, okay, that's fine. We can adapt to this changing working environment. However, I want to know who logs in and I want to know where they log in from. And I want to make sure that uh, I have boundaries in place and, and limits. I have, you know, my, my moats and my, my gates around what is a normal activity. So beyond that, we also have the session type. So or we can say where it's coming from in the time. We also can say, okay, but these users, they can log in with the VPN session because that's fine. They need to connect um, VPN, but they can't do it from their home machine because I don't know what that machine, um, you know, it's not part of my domain. I don't know if there's an antivirus on it. I don't know it. My user doesn't need to connect from it. So I'm gonna restrict it. So there's all this around you know, making sure the user is connecting where they're supposed to, but it's also so that if in the event of a compromised credential, uh, the login is useless because it's not able to connect from a VPN session from that machine that we don't know about, that we haven't entered into user lock. So it's just adding this policy of security um, like I said, for the end user, if they're playing nice and connecting when they're supposed to or what machine, they won't even know that it exists. And then probably one of the most common reasons people come to user lock and where they really see a weakness in um, their security is simultaneous connections. So users that you know, the training can be difficult to, to really make users understand that their login is really precious. You know, there's, we have privileged accounts, but really everybody in your organization has some kind of privilege. They have access to certain data. Uh, people maybe in a finance department have access to different salary data and it's all important. And anyway, once we're inside, that's where, you know, users can start moving around laterally to get to them machines and the accounts that are really uh, privileged, like IT admins and domain admin accounts. So we need to make sure that we don't have open sessions all over the place, that people can't uh, share passwords and share access to you know, what was given to them specifically for their role. They can't just give it to everybody else. Um, so simultaneous connections, we can do this. We can say, again, by session type. So what does this person need to work? And let's make sure that if you know there's a breach with their credential, we can prevent it and we can see it. Um, oh, so what I wanted to do actually here is I wanted to show you really quick. In the software, What does this look like? You can see my console here. Nick? I can. Okay. So I've opened the user lock console and immediately I can see without having to run a report or scroll through anything, I have a vision of what is happening on my network. I can see 
who's logged in to what machine. I can see whether that machine, that session is open or if it's locked, and I can see the session type. So I can see what's going on. And this is really, I think, what a lot of people come to us for too is I need visibility. I don't, I'm not able to just, you know, answer an easy question. Who is logged in where? What's going on? How come my session is locked? Um, you know, where did that breach come from? And here we can see in real time what's going on. I've got my console. Okay. Uh, and I can start to analyze and say, well, what's what's the behavior of my users? And what do I need to put in place as my security policy to make sure I'm not at risk for an attack? So uh, here I can see, for example, I've got Johnny here. He's got two sessions open. I don't understand why. Um, there's no reason for him to be on the second one. So I'm going to start analyzing, and then I'm going to start putting in intelligent policies. So Beyond Active Directory, where you can add, you know, a couple different restrictions by user, I mean, what you need is you need to be able to do this by group and OU as well. And then you can start making, um, you know, exceptions per user. But you want to have a basic policy in place. So just to show you really quick what we can do um, on this user account, I see Johnny, he's got two sessions open on two workstations. That's not normal. He shouldn't be have to, it doesn't make sense for his job. You know, what makes sense? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to limit him to one. So it's really simple. It's really easy. It's real time. And now Johnny, he's in high risk because his, his open sessions are over the limit that I've put in user lock. So I'm putting in a restriction. I'm getting some intelligence back. What's going on with this user? Um, he's got a certain user status that is not normal. So with user lock, you can see all this, you can respond. You've got the kind of reporting um, that you can really count on. So to do a real quick report on this one user, I can be 100% sure that this unlock happened at this time uh, on this machine. I don't have to like, you know, Nick gave the example with Windows auditing, one event has triggered like five different accesses and maybe it's probably pretty likely that that happened. No, I don't have to worry about that. I can see immediately what happened. Was it a lock? Was it an unlock? What machine was it on? That's it. It's super easy to um, go through. I can do it by that user. I can also maybe do it by this machine. You know, I had some weird stuff happening on my server, I'm going to go ahead and run a report and see what's going on. And whoa, look at all these people that are logging into this server. That's not normal. So I'm detecting everything. It's accurate information. I can really count on it. And now I'm going to start putting in place policy so that next time I open this report, fine, I only have IT admins logging on to this machine. I don't have normal users like Lucy and Sean. I'm going to stop all this kind of behavior that can lead to these kinds of breaches. And I'm going to do it with user log. So it's the visibility, uh, the detection, and there's also the alerting, right? So, OK, this is all great. It's all in place. But I need to know when something happens. I need to know if um, you know my really privileged users um, their connection happens somewhere strange. So here I go. I've got a pop-up. Your password may be compromised. You've had a detection on this machine. Okay, that's weird. I'm not on that machine. And I can go ahead and I can see this session has originated from this user. So what I can do immediately is I can react, right? I can block that user, I can change my password, and I can figure out, I can find out what's going on. And if I'm not logged into my machine, right? I didn't get this message here. I got it on an email. I'm not on premise. Uh, I can always go to my web console. I have the same exact information. I have the same visibility, and I'm able to react the same way. Okay, Alice, I don't know why you're logging in with my credential. Something is weird. I'm going to go ahead with one click and I'm going to say close all her sessions and block this user. I'm going to change my password. 
and I'm going to find out what's going on. So that's the that's the gist of user lock. It's something that's super easy to implement. You can see what's going on. You can react in real time. Um, with the console, I can select different things. I can send a pop-up to these users. Hey, I've got maintenance happening soon. I'm going to shut down your machine. Or I can you know, see locked machines, and I can force log offs. I can do all kinds of different stuff. So again, the point of user locked, what I really hope that you can take away, is that we're adding a contextual layer of security. It's putting in place measures for people to be able to log in when they're supposed to, where they're supposed to. And when it's like that, it's totally non-disruptive. They don't even have to know anything's happening. But to be able to see when things are abnormal, strange IIS sessions uh, coming in from weird IP addresses, you know, different remote sessions, we need to be able to put those measures in place, not just to react, but to be proactive. So I'll go back here to uh, questions. All right, great job. And I will hand it back to you. Yeah, let's go ahead and take some questions. Um, so let's see. Our first question is: Can user lock used to be used to control access on premise and cloud SaaS cloud or SaaS applications? Uh, great question. This version of user lock cannot, but that is our development for our next version is going to be totally for SaaS uh, connection. So it's in the pipe, it's in the roadmap. All right, fantastic. Uh, what if you are not a Microsoft shop? Uh, micro, user lock is only compatible with Active Directory, so you do have to have Active Directory. All right, great, let's see. Let me thumb through these questions and see what else we've got. Um, Uh, what happens if the server where user lock is installed crashes? Will my users be blocked? Uh, that's a great question. No, like um, any good uh, IT admin, we need to have a backup when things you know, um, crash. So with user lock, you can also configure a backup server. So if the primary goes down, no one has to know. Well, the IT admin will know, obviously. But the backup will take over. Your restrictions will stay in place. Uh, your events will continue to get uh, registered to the database, and as soon as the primary come back, comes back on, everything will go back to normal. All right, fantastic. We use um, a lot of SSO for a lot of our apps. Uh, how does interlock? How does user lock work with SSO? Sorry, I clearly cannot read today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, SSO is great and, you know, obviously makes uh, life easier for users, um, but it does make that first login even more, you know, precious. So um, that's really the importance of the initial login for users that have SSO. Uh, there's also different apps like, you know, an intranet or um, different uh, web applications that have SSO, but user lock can see those connections as well. So you can still get the visibility when you're working with IIS sessions. And again, SSO is, is great to put in place, especially if you know that that first login, you're watching it, you're making sure it's legit, you've got controls around that. You can be you know, more at ease with letting uh, your users have SSO. Great. Craig says that we've mentioned uh, OU quite a few times, uh, but can you tell us what that stands for or means? Uh, so an organizational unit in your Active Directory is just a way to um, compartmentalize your users. Usually you're creating, you're organizing your Active Directory by OU. So within UserLock, you can use that same organization to create restrictions and rules per OU and not so per organizational unit and not just per user, because even a small medium business, you might still have 200 users. You don't want to create a policy for 200 people. You want to create, you know, by department. And usually um, an ITM has structured an active directory with organizational units. 
by you know department or role within the company. Awesome. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple questions left, so we'll try and get to those. Uh, I'm assuming that SMB businesses require all in one an all in one solution. Can your solution fit that profile? Um, an all in one solution. I think that. I would say yes. I mean, you have these different layers, like we mentioned um, in the previous slides of, you know, you need antivirus and you do need these other uh, layers. But as far as um, an all-in-one for security, I can say that, you know, user lock is, is, the, is a good choice because you do have the auditing part. You are getting the very accurate uh, information. And you've got the security part where you're putting in restrictions. So you've got both things that are in one place and are working together, the auditing is able to give you intelligence that you can react to with policies, you know, directly related. So it's not like, you know, I know some other people that have auditing on a different solution, but then they have, you know, two-factor authentication with a totally different solution. And it's like, there's no connection, you know, one is not able to react from the other. So yeah, you have everything centralized um, and it's, uh, yeah, like I said, it's able, it's easy to to create the policy based on the intelligence of of the auditing already in the software. All right, fantastic. So it looks like we have one question left, and this is actually a really great one to end on. So Kate, I'll go ahead and ask you this question. Uh, once you're finished with that question, if you want to give us any final thoughts or words, and then Nick, we'll turn it over to you to kind of cap everything off. So Kate, our last question is: Why would user lock be a better choice for an SMB as opposed to implementing MFA? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, from my personal experience, we have clients that come to us usually when they've tried MFA um, and it's been a disaster. It's been really cumbersome. It's expensive already, you know, um, whether it has to deal with a lot of hardware, which can be lost and broken and stolen. Um, and they've just found that for, you know, the lack of time that they have, like we talked about before, it's just not feasible for um, a day-to-day -day enterprise like that. What I do think is, I think MFA is really good though, and I think that what can help you with user lock is to keep, you know, maybe that kind of multi-factor authentication for your really high privileged users and to use user lock side by side as for everyone, because really you need something for everyone. You can't have a solution that's only, um, you know, working for one group of people. It has to be accessible to everybody because like we said even if you know you've got a virus dormant on your machine and that's fine because you have no access to anything and whatever uh the minute a domain admin comes to log in you know it's uh it's disaster so every access is important um and for multi-factor in my experience maybe i don't know the audience can share theirs maybe they have different experience but clients come to us when they've tried mfa and it's just not been feasible it doesn't it's not effective and they've already spent the money so it's not like you know it, it's too late for that they have it and they still they can't use it it's just not adaptable for them all right fantastic kate do you have any final words for our audience um i would just say if you are interested in the solution we do have a, a free 30-day trial on the the website available at isdecisions.com uh, our technical team is also available for live demos. If you uh, have a specific, you know, environment, you're not really sure how it could it can work with you. I'm sure we can take the time to show you. Um, if you don't want to, to download a trial, I know sometimes that can also be another hurdle. I don't have time for that kind of stuff. It's all about time. So, you know, don't hesitate to, to contact us and uh, we can quickly uh, show you if this is the right solution for you. All right. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kate. And Nick, do you have any final words for our audience today? If I can get myself off mute, I do. Okay, now I do. Good. I had words now. I didn't have words before. I do now. So um, uh, I think it's an interesting, interesting looking, listening to all these different questions. Um, a lot of times it sounds like um, a lot of you guys in the audience are thinking about very specific technologies and how they can help. And 
um, with all the research and the, the talking and the speaking and the writing that I do around security, I think a better approach is instead of trying to find a technology and then try to figure out if it if it can you know can plug into your environment, it's more so to think about um, what are, what are you trying to protect against. Do some uh, some research. It would be very hard. There's plenty of, of stuff out there. I've written a ton of, of you know content on this as well. But on what does an attack look like, so you can understand what you're actually attacking against or protecting against, and then trying to find ways uh, of covering one or more of those. I covered like six different layers of you know where you need to have protective security in place, and and try to cover more of those so that you have a way of stopping those attacks from happening. Um, uh, Kate hit on the idea around credentials. I've talked about that a little bit today as well. Um, the issue of credentials is a, is a, a key part of any attack because they need elevated um, permissions in order to gain access to additional systems move laterally and ultimately to the data that they want to either exfiltrate, hold for ransom, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, having a, something in place that's covering sort of like I see user lock is maybe covering your users because it's protecting your users from um, you know, misusing uh, the environments to insider threats from an attacker leveraging even a little of a user's credentials and that example I think you gave Kate of like logging in on Saturday at 3 a.m. Yeah, that kind of thing is so protecting its users. It's sort of helping protect the endpoint because it's stopping a user at the log on. Um, it's also protecting privileged accounts there. And then just the fact that there's a, an automatic ability to respond here, doing things like automatically logging someone off and so on, makes us very, very powerful. So um, those are my final thoughts. Um, Kate, let me also say thank you to you for a great conversation today. I really appreciate all your input. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was, it was a, a really good time. You guys in the audience, hope you learned something today. And uh, Emily, you can go ahead and close this out. All right, fantastic. So guys, if you had to step out or miss any part of this presentation, look out for an email from us in a couple of days with a link to check out the webinar on demand. Thanks so much for tuning in today and we hope to see you back next time. And thanks Kate and thanks Nick. Y'all have a great day.